So I'd like to welcome first Hugo Mate, is a professor of the University of Turin and an Alfred, Alfred and Hannah Fromm Disting, Distinguished Professor of International and Comparative Law at the University of California, Hastings College of the Law. He has offered, authored over 100 publications and is a member of the Accademia Internazionale di Diritto Comparato. He's editor-in-chief of the Global Jurist, a member of the board of the American Journal of Comparative Law and of the International Review of Law and Economics. He is currently leading a study on commons for the Common Core of European private law and is one of the key figures in the Italian commons movement, not only in the context of the 2011 Italian referendum on water that we are very familiar with, I think, but also in the context of the high-speed trains in the Susa Valley and the occupation and transformation of theatres into commons in the case, for example, of the Teatro Valley in Rome. He is the current president of ABC Napoli, the first public common management of water in a large metropolitan area in Italy. I'd also like to introduce Joshua Farley. He is an ecological economist and associate professor in community development and applied economics and public administration. Joshua holds a degree in biology, international affairs, and economics, and he has previously served as program director at the School for Field Studies. Center for Rainforest Rainforest Studies, and an executive director of the University of Maryland International Institute for Ecological Economics. Uh, He recently returned from a Fulbright Fellowship in Brazil, where he served as a visiting professor at the Federal University of Santa Catarina and Bahia. His broad research interests focus on the design of an economy capable of balancing what is biophysically possible with what is socially, psychologically, and ethically desirable. More specifically, his research focuses on mechanisms for allocating resources under local control and national sovereignty. I'd like to give a warm welcome for these two speakers. I'll do it from standing up. All right, so um, I'm actually going to give the perspective. I was trained as a neoclassical economist to be a neoliberal tool, you know, working for the IMF or World Bank. And uh, I don't refer to it as my doctorate degree, I refer to it as my indoctrination degree, and it never took. So I'm actually, one of the things I'm going to be focusing on here, so, oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> this is a problem I have. Um, so um, I'm actually going to be taking the approach, I'm going to be trying to explain why from even within the framework of conventional economics, there are huge types of resource problems that can't be solved. And we desperately need alternative collective action tools to manage these resources. So I'm kind of taking a a big picture view, not specific uh, commons approaches, but explaining, trying to explain clearly why we need collective action, some kind of commons ownership to deal with the most serious problems we face. Um, So uh, to begin with, I want to start out with what is economics? In economics, the conventional definition is the allocation of scarce resources among alternative desirable ends, how we take what we have to create what we want. And within that definition, the first question you have to ask as an economist is what is it we want? What are our goals as a society? The second thing you have to look at is what resources do we have to attain those goals? And only then can you ask what mechanisms are appropriate for allocation. So do we use market mechanisms? Do we use common ownership? Do we use the public sector? The third question can only be answered in response to the first two. Conventional econ programs launch right into the third one. The answer to everything is free markets, and that's a very backward way of doing economics. So what is it, what is it we want? In fact, I will try to speak slowly, and I'll skip a few slides. My typical approach is to put in more information and speak quickly. <laughs> but... So I would argue that, you know, all economists will agree that what we want to do is what they say, maximize utility, maximize some differential between pleasure and pain, well-being for all. So simply put, you could think of a high quality of life for this and future generations. The question is, how do we achieve that high quality of life? 
Some believe there's a wide range of human needs that need to be satisfied, that we have our physiological needs for health and food and sustenance, that we have needs to be healthy communities. We are people in community. We are not atomistic individuals. We need fulfilling social relationships. We need jobs that are meaningful and rewarding, that aren't work in that sense, but that are uh, something meaningful. So some of us would define that as the desirable ends. Conventional economists actually argue that we can't, we don't know what utility is. I don't know what you feel compared to what I feel. I don't know if you like oranges more than I like oranges. We can't make interpersonal comparisons. And therefore, the best we can hope for is to look at revealed preferences. I know what you want based on what you buy. And therefore, we can go from that to maximizing monetary value of everything bought and sold is the definition of utility is the goal of an economic system, is to maximize monetary value. And that is what neoclassical economics boils down to is the ultimate end for human welfare is maximizing monetary value. And they say we've achieved a way to do this that allows complete freedom of choice. So it's a very libertarian philosophy, freedom of choice, maximizing monetary values, those are the conventional goals. And I, you know, freedom of choice is a good one. Um, so I want to look at, uh, you know, whether or not our economic system can achieve this. So what do we have? What are the resources available to achieve these goals? So to begin with, we start from the laws of physics, a simple law of physics. You can't make something from nothing. Everything the economy produces requires raw materials from nature. You also can't do work without energy. 86% of the energy we use is fossil fuels. We use that energy to transform raw materials into something of value to humans. You can't make nothing from something. Everything we produce eventually returns to nature as waste. We burn a barrel of oil. It doesn't disappear. It becomes particulate matter and CO2 and dissipated heat energy. Um, and the disorder increases is a basic law of physics. Those are the law of physics, but we have to look at the laws of ecology. Those raw materials that we convert into economic products alternatively serve as the structural building blocks of our ecosystems. And structure generates function. A particular configuration of those structural building blocks creates these ecosystems that regulate atmospheric gases, regulate climate, regulate water flows, purify water, uh, pro are capable of reproduction. You need the system to reproduce. And these, so um, when we take that ecosystem structure to make economic products, we are degrading and transforming that ecosystem itself. The removal of structure and the return of waste degrades the function, which including these basic life support functions, which means that every time we produce something for the economy, we have a negative impact on global ecosystems and life support functions. And we need economic products to survive. There's no question. But we also need these basic life support functions of ecosystems to survive. Both of these are essential to civilization. And there's unavoidable trade-offs. You can't have the one, you can't have the economic products without affecting your ecosystem services. So um, we also need information to do any work. Any kind of economic activity requires information. And information is one of these things that improves through use. It's grass that grows greener the more you graze it, as we know from the commons literature. It plays an absolutely critical role in solving ecological problems. So if we want to transform to a post-carbon economy, we do need alternative forms of energy. We need to consume an awful lot less, but we need to use energy that doesn't destroy the environment. We need green technologies. We need all sorts of technologies to meet human needs. And the interesting thing about these technologies, the value, let's say we develop a clean, decentralized, alternative form to fossil fuels, the value of that resource, that knowledge, increases the lower the price goes. The value is maximized at a price of zero, which takes it completely outside the domain of conventional economics. And you can actually, this is within neoclassical analysis, you can show the value of information is maximized at a price of zero. So, you know, information automatically fails to conform to the rules of conventional economics. But I want to break this problem down. I want to break the economic problem down into two parts. 
And the first part is what I call a macro allocation problem. So we have this ecosystem structure that provides life-sustaining ecosystem functions, ecosystem services, or can be physically transformed into economic products also necessary for our survival. The challenge is how do we decide how much ecosystem structure to leave intact for humans and other species, and how much is available to transform to meet human needs. And so our goal here, it's sufficient well-being for humans and other species, um, now and in the future. And there's these, we're all in this together, these vital life support functions of a stable climate, a healthy ozone layer, water regulation, oceans capable of uh, you know, creating the oxygen, everything we need. These are shared by all. We can't have private ownership of these things. It's absolutely impossible to have private ownership, which means the decision about how much can be provided or should be provided will never be achieved by the market. This is something completely outside of the market domain. So what we um, – there are potential, like, solutions to this problem. So the reform solution, the try to – there's this idea of incorporating these aspects of nature into the market. They talk about internalizing externalities through markets. And some of these things, I have to say, these things could buy us time. If they're the best we can get in the short run, they will buy us time until we achieve more meaningful solutions. But the basic idea, one approach, is price determines scale. We raise the prices of things that destroy the economy, and this will affect the scale. By scale, I mean that economies capture of ecosystem structure for economic uses, we can affect prices, for example, through green taxes, and that will determine how much we use. The idea here, though, is, you know, what we love about the market is it's our individual freedom of choice. We decide what to do, we decide what to buy, what to produce, and the feedback mechanism of the price leads to this equilibrium outcome. But as soon as we have the state intervening to set prices, what you need is if, if it's true that every resource we take from nature burns energy, returns pollution, depletes ecosystem structure, there is a, and those things, markets don't capture those impacts, there's a non-market price for every economic good or service. And what these economists say is we have to get a team of technocrats to estimate that price, feed it to politicians, who will then feed it back into the economic system and incorporate it into economic prices. But in my view, this is a centralized pricing system. This is the antithesis of what markets are all about. So it's very interesting that to save the market, some economists want to essentially destroy what markets are supposed to be good at. Um, and that takes away our freedom. I would never have the freedom, you know, uh, uh, Exxon can pollute as much as it wants as long as it pays the tax. I have no freedom to have a clean, healthy environment. There's no freedom involved here. They have the freedom to pollute. They have to pay liabilities. But I do not, we do not have the freedom to a healthy uh, ecosystem. There's another approach that scale determines price. We decide, okay, there's a physiological or a bio, a ecological capacity of ecosystems to absorb CO2 or to purify water. We can limit waste emissions to within that ecological capacity. We Ecology decides how much is available, and then we allow prices to adjust to that. The problem with this is if we step in and say there's a fixed amount of CO2 that can be emitted, you have to buy a permit to emit it, then we have a, a completely inflexible supply. Supply cannot adjust increases in price. The, supply incre the price increases rapidly with a small decrease in supply, which means that speculators are going to step in, they're going to snap these up, they're going to hold them back from the market, that's going to send the price skyrocketing upward, we'll get a wildly speculative economy that's destabilizing, creates bubbles, undermines you know, a healthy economy, and it's very difficult. I would argue instead for a more... Okay, I would argue instead for um, a more revolutionary approach, we internalize externalities by expanding who makes the decision. My decision to drive a car and spew CO2 is an externality if I make the decision. If we make this decision as a commons, as a collective, we get the benefits from burning fossil fuels. We pay the cost from burning fossil fuels. We have internalized the externality by redefining the decision-making unit to encompass all of us. And we then focus on first ecological sustainability. How much damage can we do to ecosystems? Second, who is entitled to those the surplus resources available? Distribution issue comes second. Only third do you worry about the specific allocation, what specific activities get those resources. Um, and uh, 
because I'm speaking slow, I will do, be a little less elaboration on some topics. There's, but once we've decided, once we've decided that here are the resources, the ecosystem structure that has to be set aside uh, to meet basic life support functions for humans and other species, there's now this surplus that can be allocated among other uses. How do we decide how to use that surplus? I call this the micro-allocation problem. How do we use available ecosystem structure to produce different economic products? And the question is, do markets achieve this efficiently? And I want to look at examples of water, land, food, and energy quite quickly, about a minute each, I guess. Um, and uh, so first, I want to say that markets and essential resources. So there's essential resources we need, absolutely need. Food, land, water, energy, these things are necessary. Market advocates say markets maximize utility. But market demand is preferences weighted by purchasing power. My preferences mean nothing if I have no purchasing power to back it up, which means that exchange value trumps use value in a market. And to take a look at a concrete example of this, in 2007-2008, the price of grains, corn and rice doubled, the price of wheat tripled. What happened to consumption of wheat and uh, corn, rice in the U.S. and Germany? It went up because we spend such a small, such a small part of our purchasing power spent on food. We don't care about the price. Countries that consume less than 2,000 calories a day saw their consumption plunge. Countries that consume more than 3,000 calories a day actually increase their consumption. My view is that markets allocate resources to those who need them the least. We're weighting preferences by purchasing power. We're allocating resources to the overfed instead of the underfed. We're minimizing utility in an unequal world through market allocation. We're making, you know, there's no question that reallocating wealthy uh, food from the, the uh, overfed to the underfed makes everyone better off. Um, so now let's take a look. Look at the case of water. Water is very interesting because it's what economists refer to as a natural monopoly. It makes no sense to have... So what we do is we have a huge reservoir, huge water lines, huge fixed cost, major investment. If you have one household on that system, you divide those fixed costs among one household. It's each additional household is very, very cheap to add to that system. It would make no sense if you replicated, if you had competition in the water sector... Ten different companies with a reservoir and uh, main lines going to your house, that would increase costs tenfold. Competition increases costs for resources with this characteristic. On the other hand, you can minimize costs with a monopoly, but if it's a for-profit monopoly, you can charge any price you want. Markets cannot solve the water problem. The so the first problem is how do we make sure there's enough water for all species and humans? Next problem, channeling water to people's houses. Markets simply cannot do that. If we do have markets and try to maximize profits, you look at who is willing to pay for the water. South Africa tried to raise their prices to reflect costs of provision. Rich people kept buying drinking water to flush their toilets and fill their swimming pools. Poor people could not afford drinking water to keep their kids from dying from dysentery and had to drink from the rivers into which those toilets were flushed. So what we see then is, you know, we started a cholera epidemic, enormous costs for doing that. So I do have to finish up now. Um, I was going to go on with a couple of other issues, but I basically want to say that um, what we need is certain problems cannot be solved through the market. This macro allocation problem, ensuring ecological sustainability, can't be solved through markets. We need some kind of collective action, some kind of comments. Just distribution of resources can't be solved through markets. Um, markets are inefficient when resources are essential and, uh, um, you know, or not depleted through use. So basically, you know, we need to have, um, decide how we allocate resources, not based on our ideology, but on our desirable lens and the physical characteristics of those resources. The most serious problems we face simply cannot be solved by markets. We really do need collective action and common ownership. And uh, I got to stop now. Um, normally I speak twice as fast, would have gotten in twice as much, but it uh, doesn't work with translators. <laughs> So, um, good morning. 
first, let me comment very briefly on the title of the conference to put my remarks in context. Uh, commons and economics. Um, I come from an experience uh, that is called law and economics. And law and economics ended up being economics conquering the law. Okay, so hopefully the fact that we put it economics before, as a matter of politeness, will be the commons that conquer economics and not the other way around. But there is always a risk when we use two terms that one over, over, over takes the other. Okay, so that was a point that I wanted to make in terms of developing a field of research. We are giving a lot of space to economics, at least in, in, our, in our title. I don't know whether we can do it in our... Uh, working the commons. The other thing that I wanted to, to start to th just a few words about is this idea of revolution and reform. Uh, revolution has been never used as much as these current years in which it's not happening. I mean, lot of, there is a lot of talks about revolution going on. You know, there are political parties that are called revolution, uh, and revolution is not happening. So um, revolution and reform uh, can be seen from the perspective of revolution, and that uh, ended up becoming somewhat kind of an internal thing. We say, okay, we talk about revolution, but it's not re the real thing. You know, it's a kind of a transformation, a deep transformation of our Weltanschauung, the way we see the things. That's a way to look at revolution that you know can be satisfactory or not. I don't find it particularly satisfactory. But the same thing is happening to the reformer also. I, I, I've been working a little bit on this notion of reform recently. Reform used to mean achieving gradually the result that revolution achieves fast. Okay? So in the, in the socialist tradition, there would be like the maximalist tradition that does the revolution like you know, getting the winter palace. And on the other hand, there would be the reformist strategy to get to the same result. You build a socialist society in a more gradualistic way by using the current institutions. That was the meaning of reform. Today, when we talk about reform in the neoliberal order, that means exactly the opposite. Reform means rather than a process of gradual inclusion and construction of a society that is more equal, reform today means something the opposite seems transferring as much as possible of public resources in the private domain. Means creating structures that make government stable, makes possibility to decide, makes the law market friendly, creates flexibility in, 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 in labor markets. So reform today is basically a process of privatization of the public sector. That's what we mean by reform. You know, political parties say, oh, I'm for reform, and the idea is I want to create a system that is market-friendly, efficient, good for competition. So reform really shifted meaning as well. And this shift of meaning on reform, and I'm going to get right into the talk that I'm trying to give here, I'm going to share with you a very practical experience, which is the experience of the water privatization slash republicization in Naples. And this is a quite interesting, is a quite in interesting experience because it brings us to how do you get to a point in which you transform a society by putting more commons at the center of the stage. And yesterday there were some of the questions, and there were in the remarks in the afternoon, someone asked, well, how are we going to deal with the corporation? What is going to happen? You know, we are talking about commoning and creating common structure and common institution, but then we leave the real thing to corporations. Corporations are more and more strong. They conquer more and more spaces that used to be public. Actually, one of the best definitions of neoliberalism is really the transfer of public spheres into corporate hands. That's the real structure of neoliberalism. So, in Naples we kind of tried to go the other way around. After the referendum of 2011, the idea was, is it possible to take a corporation, a private corporation, with a private corporate form, so a for-profit corporate form, and transform it into a public corporation that is a non-for-profit form that is not really owned by, not just 
substituting the ownership of the private sector or with the public sector. Actually, the company, the private company in Naples was actually owned by the city of Naples that was making profit on that. Okay? Now, how are we going to turn and transform into something different? How are we going to do that? First of all, there is one thing that you're not going to transform as a reform. You're not going to transform a private corporation into something public uh, by commoning. It's not like, you know, a gala dinner. It's not something that you're going to say, okay, come in and do it. Okay? You need a lot of non-commoning authority to make the transformation. That was what I learned in these last couple of years. You need to go there, you need to get in the bottom room, you need to struggle for power, and you need then to create and to transform the bylaws of the corporation in such a way that the corporation then, eventually, will stop acting as a corporation. And you have to introduce control so that this thing can happen and last. Okay? And this is something that really requires you know, some sort of non-sharing attitude. Because there are lots of vested interests in corporations. There are lots of vested interests in corporations. So if you change the vision, the vision of the corporation is very simple. Profit. And everybody who holds shares, no matter whether it's the public sector or the private sector, the moment in which someone holds shares is only interested in the value of these shares and the return the share grant. You know? So there are public corporations, private corporations owned by the public. Here the public-private is where it really gets tricky, that behave as much as sharks as privately owned corporations because the politicians in the city need those shares, the value of those shares and that money at the end of the year in order to carry on the business of the city and the municipality. Okay? So you're not going to have friends, neither in the private sector nor in the public sector, in trying to do this kind of transformations. That's one point. So you are not getting to a common institution by commoning practices in a reformist way, that is, in a way that respects the law. You can get to commoning institutions by commoning practices if you are willing to break the law. Okay, so this is one very important thing. There are things that are compatible with the given legal order and things that are not. Okay, if you want to follow the, the given legal order, the given legal order is hierarchical, is based on concentration of power, and you need to play with those rules. You can create rules of commoning, you know, if you occupy a theater, for example. Now, you occupy a place, and then you create, you do the way you want. If you have enough force, or if the politicians are scared enough not to try to kick you off, then you can build the commons from the scratch. But you are trying to build the common by playing at the rules, you need concentration of power for a while. Okay, that's one point. Second point, which, was, which I experienced in this last year and a half, is that the neoliberal legal order is extremely unbalanced. This is a big problem. No matter whether you love the, the, the illegal order or not, doesn't matter whether you are a revolutionary guy or a reformist, you are going to face a legal system that is imbalanced in favor of the private. The law makes it extremely easy to privatize. There is nothing easier than privatizing resources. If you are a municipality, you want to sell your you know, gas company or your water company or whatever you want to sell, you're going to find it very, very easy from the legal point of view. The law helps you. The law favors you. Not the law in general, the neoliberal legal order that was developed in the West beginning in the early 90s. We transformed and we changed our civil code, for example, that deals with transformations. We have all sorts of rules on how to privatize that facilitate the privatization process, the transformation of public entity into private corporations. There are no laws in the Italian legal order, and we did some comparative research, and there is not much even elsewhere, that shows you how to go the other way around. What, if after, what, what happens if, after you have privatized something, you change your mind? You say, okay, I have privatized the water company system, because they thought I was like in the neoliberal dreaming of the mid-90s, and they thought it was a good idea. 
Now, after 15 years, I say, you know what? It not, was not a good idea. It was a mistake. Now, can I come back? The answer is simply no. Or at least you can do it, but you need to force the legal system by interpretation. There is no way you can find an easy pathway that is indicated by the legal system to do that. And it took us an, a year and a half of hard work and research to find legal ways to interpret Article 2500 of the Italian Civil Code in such a way that the transformation from the private to the public would be actually something uh, possible to apply and to extend in the transformation to, for, uh, in the other way around. Okay, so that needed study. You need interpretation in order to interpret, then you need what? You need something around you that gives you a good argument that the logic of the neoliberal law is not serving the interest of the collectivity. So that, that can you find and persuade either a notary or a judge that your interpretation is a good interpretation, which is a clear interpretation that is outside of the law, let's face it. The transformation of the Naples corporation into a public entity is, technically speaking, an illegal act in the sense that it is a ex very extensive interpretation of the law that was possible only because at some point the Constitutional Court interpreted the referendum results of 2011 in such a way that the court said, okay, there is a people will that should be respected, that the water should be public, and therefore there should be public institutions that are capable to make us govern the water. And so after the decision of the Constitutional Court, we were able to find an authority that said, what the heck, you know, I'm going to take the risk. And I'm going to draft you know, the transformation so that the transformation can happen. Okay? And that is only one part, because once you're done with that, then you have a lot of fiscal issues. There are huge fiscal issues, because the legal, system is not, the legal system is actually creating so many difficulties for the attempts to go from the private into the public that the tax law is after you. So you do the thing, and then you, find, you get stuck into taxation issues. Complicated, to be interpreted. A lot of money in lawyers. Labor law issues, huge labor law issues. You know, you were private, now you are public. So what does that mean? How do you hire people? How is your labor contract going to become? Okay, huge issues also from that point of view. So there is a lot of work to be done to be done for lawyers, and that work and that works is damn expensive. Okay, and has to be faced and tackled in a way that is. And this and we are here just to the form. Then you get to the substance. What does it mean? to actually transform a corporation from a for-profit into an ecological, commons-based corporation. You need to change the bylaws. So the purpose, the DNA of the corporation should be different. Okay? So the corporation is not there to make profit, it's there to run the water system in an ecological, sustainable, long-term way so that it takes into consideration the needs of the society that it's serving. We are serving there 1 million people. We have a business that is almost 200 million a year activity. So we are talking about, we are talking about a serious corporation with a lot of investment money. Okay? To run that in a way that, is, that works and is stable is difficult also from the point of view of managerial skills. It's not like running you know, a little device or a little bakery shop. It's a different thing because you are, facing, uh, you are facing the structures and the difficulties of the real life of the law, which is not friendly to our agenda, is not friendly to the idea of reform that we might, we might have in mind here. So once you did the transformation and you changed the bylaws, and we did that, then you have to check that this purpose, this ecological commons purpose, is in some way respected by the new entity. And here is where we are now. This is really another kind of tricky thing, because if you are a for-profit corporation, you have a very natural way to check whether you're doing good or, or, or bad, and that is profit. If you're making money, you are a good corporation. If you're losing money, you are a bad corporation. It's very simple. There is an agency of control, and that agency of control is called the market. Once you get to a commons device, I'm done, this, this agency of control is not out there. And so you need to create it. 
You need to create it because, you know, it's not the market. You need to lose money in a certain perspective. But the money, yeah, you need to lose money. But the money you are losing, you need to show that you are actually gaining it back from the kind of money you are saving to the old system, to the commons, in the, by the ecological way you are running the system, okay? So we haven't lost money in the first year and a half. Now we have created, actually, a system to check that is based on participation. If I had more time and if you have any curiosity, I'm, I'm ready to talk, but I need another five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>